Good. Coming up. So I call this uh, foundational concepts. Um, I think a lot of people have this idea of approach to digital innovation, transformation, and really trying to leverage digital tools, analytics, et cetera, in the space of clinical development and healthcare. And it's not always well done, as you know, from many companies who struggle. I've seen large companies struggle with this, and I've seen small to medium sized companies, um, you know, grasping at trying to get to a place of good transformative implementations. And so what I'm going to review uh, is not just specifically on a platform use case, but taking a step back, looking at what are the core concepts for really good design thinking, for, for intelligent adaption of technologies for needs, and for broader community adoption. And so it's a little bit of pivot away from what uh, I originally had uh, in the title, but I think this will be a little bit um, more beneficial for everyone across the board. So first, I'd like to say you can reach me on LinkedIn. Please reach out. I'm happy to connect with you and talk through uh, any of the points I share on today or discuss further detailed potential use cases, et cetera. Uh, I love to help companies through transformation. That's one of my passions is... Uh, really helping leverage digital tools in an agile way to create practical step change and transformation that really impacts uh, the way people work. And at the end of the day, helps us all to work in a, in a better way. And so you can find me on LinkedIn, a little bit of my background. I was trained in uh, biochemistry and chemistry and did my research in bioinformatics and then came out and worked at Shearing Plow for a few years in protein chemistry doing uh, drug substance production for monoclonal, anti monoclonal antibodies in the um, space of uh, cytokines, uh, interleukins. And so a lot of the drugs that we're seeing in the market come out now are things I was able to work on uh, uh, over a decade ago, which is fantastic to see. I transitioned to Novartis, where I was there for uh, 10 years and uh, was in the biomarker operations space, supporting clinical trials, worked on over 100 different clinical trials in oncology, solid and heme space, cell and gene therapy, as well as rare diseases. And so I had a good breadth there before transitioning into strategy and operations for the past few years. Uh, again, bringing my skills in informatics along the way to every kind of step and area that I've been, I was able to develop over about 15 different platforms across the various groups and times that I, I was uh, there at Novartis and unlock new capabilities within those groups, um, help to create solid foundations and structures in data and unleash the flows that they needed to really augment and, and create new capabilities. So uh, definitely please reach out and connect. Uh, look forward to talking to you outside. Um, but to get right into this, you know, what is good principles? What are good principles for design thinking? What are uh, foundational concepts that people need to keep in mind? First, I'd like to just level set and say, you know, good design thinking is really an approach that takes into consideration not only the technology, not only the business needs, but really the people that are using platforms to do work and the way people work. And, and the goal of good design thinking is to really transform the way people work. At the end of the day, that's the goal. So many times and cases I've seen in companies, projects that focus around two of these centers, uh, let's say technology and uh, business needs. And so you have this feasible, possible uh, uh, opportunity in technology that presents itself. Business has a use case and together they form this platform and they say, okay, this should totally transform the organization. And while they go through the development work there, uh, no one is consulted in the actual work who, who's doing that work. You know, users are not really taken into account on um, interface or experience. And so you get these platforms that have high capability, but low usability. On the other side of the hand, uh, coin, you get you know, business needs that are met with uh, the people using day-to-day uh, -day, uh, platforms and, and also kind of methods of working that are standard. You may have an overlap between business and people, 
where you can get really good adoption in terms of process integration, uh, training, you get transformation, but it's very low tech. And so you can think about all the spreadsheets you've had to fill out in the past and uh, monthly meetings and processes and uh, decision boards, et cetera, just to get work done. Not very scalable, not very um, effective and, and translatable across boundaries. And so every time you have a new process, you kind of have a new low tech solution. And, and that, again, it's only like two out of the three working here. And uh, in other cases, you get IT approaching users directly and saying, hey, we got this great tool. This looks like this, this will work well for your area. And you have um, a lot of testing that happens. And so the user integrations there, IT is working very well hand in hand with them, but the business isn't well consulted. In the end, the platform works for people. They like the way it works, but it doesn't actually meet the business needs. And so you can think of some of these off the shelf uh, cases that you'll run into where you can buy into a platform service. Uh, the UI UX looks fantastic. It's, all, it's got all the uh, bells and whistles, it's shiny, and uh, it looks great, but when business goes to use it, it doesn't actually fit with the business needs. Perhaps the data quality process isn't integrated into the platform. Um, perhaps the platform isn't ex exactly tailored to what the business is trying to accomplish or the systems that the business has. And so any one of these pieces being left out of the puzzle ultimately leads to a solution that is incomplete. And so what I like to do when I talk to people and, and work with um, companies is really help them focus on a holistic approach. Thinking about where are the players, the stakeholders, where are the users, both up and down the value chain? You know, you have the senior management uh, reports, you have also the person who's putting in the information, the very ground level. How are they accessing it? How are they using it? What does that look like? And technology adoption. What are the fundamental technology pieces that are being leveraged? Are they agile? Can they be easily adapted? And so putting all these elements together really helps to create good design thinking. Again, focusing on a human-centered approach that integrates the needs of the people and the business, the possibilities of the technology, and really those requirements. What does this need to do? So how do you do this? How can you go from the world of possibilities out to something that you can actually use? Um, what I was referencing was uh, an e-protocol platform I was originally, originally going to speak to, but what I'm going to speak to I think would be actually more valuable is to talk to about the process. How do you really drive and develop something that's possible from a world of possibilities? We see all these different platforms popping up, people saying they can do X, Y, and Z very quickly for you, and oftentimes a little bit of um, uh, dubious uh, 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 concern, um, you know, maybe a little bit of uh, skepticism from the industry because they've heard this before. They've seen uh, companies come before and say, oh, we can apply machine learning to everything and solve all your problems. It's not, no, it's not that easy. There's a lot of considerations here, especially in clinical development data, as we, as we know. And so how do you really develop something um, either with a partner or internally that will really fit needs? And so I talk about this process of going from an open design to an MVP, a minimally viable product. And I see a lot of work that gets stuck somewhere in these stages. And so I wanted to speak to some of this. I think it's important that we entertain the possibilities of um, new, new capability, new technology. The sky's the limit, right? You get into this blue sky stage and you look at what's possible. You really try to remove the limitations and get out of the box, dream a little bit, envision, you know, what could we do? You know, you see all these other platforms popping up and say, if they do that, how could we do something similar in our space to help patients? And so really having that drive, I think can open us to the new technologies and new platforms. But in general, the pharma industry has been a bit slow to adopt. And could it be perhaps because of technical debt burden to systems that are older and, and less agile, possibly. Could also just be a mindset shift. 
and seeing how quickly an uh, new platforms can spring up if you have a solid use case and very clear definition could be also part of that but in this first stage when you're going through this kind of blue sky thinking it's really important to ask yourself are all the needs considered what are we driving at who are we serving are all the stakeholders addressed do we have the community's input getting early engagement right and once you have all these pieces kind of going really wide with it then from there starting to just little by little refine and intersect the current reality. Not to say that you have to be limited by current reality, but just take into mind where you're coming from. Where are you building a bridge to? And really where you're building a bridge from going into the future. Prioritizing your features, your capabilities, uh, assessing them, planning them out. You really wanna know what does good look like. Planning for your success markers and your milestones and you're defining all the key elements that need to come together uh, during the stage of refining. And here you have to ask yourself, do we have a good balance between what the priority is and what the possibility is? So you, wanna, you don't wanna be so narrowly defined that yes, you hit the priority, but then in the end you have no longevity. You have no growth potential. Going from a refinement stage into distillation, you form more of a development plan, something that's a bit more concrete with timelines and costs. You clarify the limitations. We will do X, we're not gonna do Y yet, or we're gonna get to Y in a certain period of time. And you confirm that you get buy-in, fully in from up and down the stakeholder uh, chain. So management buys in, but users buy in, communities buy in. Um, people commit to engaging and adopting early on, again, even before you have the minimally viable product in place, the MVP, you wanna get that early stakeholder buy-in. And so ask yourself in this stage, what does growth look like? Longevity and sustainability look like in a platform? And you go from this conceptual possibility to more of a concrete product in this case. So once you have this solid idea for an MVP, where do you go? Well, we go to a place I call uh, all in and buy in, right? And this is really important that you get this up front. Stakeholder alignment, community engagement, partnership and accountability, this is tremendous. These are simple words, but with a lot of ramification. A lot of people will go through the stakeholder alignment and, and get the okays from management and say, okay, we're gonna do this. We get the approval from IT, we go to go do it and no communicate, uh, no community engagement, and no real partnership there with the people who are doing the work. And so you're kind of informing them after the fact, say, hey, you guys are gonna adopt this new technology, this new platform, and by the way, it doesn't meet a third of the things that your prior processes do. Well, you're gonna have a real hard time getting engagement, getting uptake on that. A lot of people don't intend to go in doing that, but unfortunately, sometimes the delivery doesn't match the upfront agreement. And so having that community engagement and buy-in, that partnership to really say, does this meet the needs? Does this do the work and more of what you're needing to be done? Once you have that in place, getting these upfront commitments of resources and expertise it's not about just dollars, it's having the right people at the table and being able to have that early on and throughout the process, getting the SMEs, the people doing the work, working with the data, whether it's clinical lab data or whether it's operational data, getting the right people at the table, and having a clear line of sight of value. What's the value proposition? When do we reach that? And how can we add value along the way? All of those pieces are critical combining that with having an open channel for rapid and continual improvement. And so I think about communication channels being very important when you go through these types of developments and transformations. Right from the get-go, you wanna open up and ask the questions, what are the needs? You know, where do people have the biggest pain points? How do we truly transform and become innovative in our industry? You know, are the, way, the ways that we're operating in, in terms of uh, collating documents and creating protocols and synopses and form consents, investigator brochures, can we do this in a different way? 
uh, can we review data in a different way? And we know that we can, it's just hard to get to. Putting all this together in a plan that's cohesive can be very challenging for companies, especially when they're limited in infrastructure already. And the alternative is kind of trying to buy an off-the-shelf product from vendors. Sometimes that works, sometimes not so much. You kind of get half the puzzle and you don't really get the full support you need. So having this kind of partnership, I think is a better approach in the end for companies to help create this step change and transformation. In the end, you wanna have this all together to create that integration. You wanna monitor the success as you go, and then you wanna share your wins and, and how this rolls out. Now, obviously, this is a, a simplistic overview, but I'm talking about foundational concepts that are critical to really ensure the right components are there for transforming uh, organizations through technology, through digital innovation. And an essential to this is community adoption. You know, people like to use data and leverage it and, and talk about platforms and create metrics and KPIs and good metrics, they are more than just measurements. They're really the signposts that you're getting towards your goal, right? It's not just about measuring something and reporting it. It's really about telling the larger story, getting all of the elements that you need to really create that story and have an outcome from that story that's really going where you wanna go. And so that's, that's a key part of this. Community adoption is one of those pieces. You have in that community adoption, the critical elements of the people, the process, the way that they work and how they're doing their day-to-day -day operations and the tools. And I like to say that the people should be amenable. Uh, in the people realm, you always get a bit of a challenge because people are at different places for adopting and learning and growing. Some people say, mm, technology, change, new platforms. Uh, I'm just gonna work with pen and paper. Leave me to do it the way I know how. And that's okay but you wanna always create an, uh, an open culture and foster that. Uh, you want your community to have, uh, to adopt and maintain this growth mindset of, wow, if we just change a little bit, this could really open up a lot of new doors for us. So the people should be amenable. The process, the processes that are surrounding the work that's being done and touched by this platform, the processes should be adoptable. So what are you asking people to do in the end? Uh, is it too dissimilar from what they're doing already? And if it is, do they have the training and the support? Is there a practical application to how they sh should operate with a new platform? Does it make their lives easier or is it just a mess? I've seen it both ways. And then obviously having that meaningful integration along with the platform so that the way that they work really tailors uh, together from where they're at currently to where they need to go. And having technology that's forward compatible, again, fit for purpose, you know, all of these pieces and components are critical. Having the people, the process, the tools and technology all together helps complete that so that you can get that wheel turning. Uh, just two of these pieces, you're not going to go very far. When we talk about community adoption, it's important to know that there are phases for this. And so here I'm showing a bit of the creative life cycle curve for adoption. Understanding innovation doesn't just happen in a closet and explode and everyone's using it. There is this uptake that happens from these people who are the early adopters. You've got the innovators, of course, who are out in the, on the edge creating the new, kind of seizing that possibility and trying to get it to work and, and getting that, that proof of concept into place. We know this all too well in drug development. Uh, you know, your, your pocks are very tenuous and, and you have many failures along the way. But finally you get something and you go to phase one, right? And so our early adopters are almost like that phase one where we get this first uptick and they're looking to see something that could be transformative. These are people who are typically adopting new things and trying out new things, not afraid of failure, not afraid of a little bit of pain with the, with the growth. 
And once you get to this point, um, it's about 13 and a half percent of adoption. You, you see this uh, upswing start to happen. A little bit more chatter in the organization. People start to say, hey, you know, what's happening, right? And so you have this, this place right here. We get to kind of a critical mass, right? It's roughly about 16%, including the innovators. And it's, it's been shown in marketing that it's a required percentage that you need to pass in terms of adoption to get a successful community engagement for the broader majority. And after the early adopters, this early majority starts to uptake. They are interested, this group of people, they're interested, but they wanna wait and kind of see a little bit of the bugs worked out, right? They don't just wanna waste their time, but they really do wanna be more effective in the way they work. And so the early majority is important. When I talk about community engagement and discussion, um, having those open channels, you really wanna have it for each of the people in the different groups. And oftentimes personality and mental uh, space, culture also can drive where the organization is. Do you have a lot of innovators and, and uh, do you have a lot of early adopters? Or do you have a lot of kind of people who are on the late end and really don't want to change much? They just want to operate the way they know and just work with what they know. And, and so you can actually shift from different sizes and different ways. You know, different group distributions can be shifted within companies based on the initiatives that they have, based on the, the culture that they have, and also based on the discussions they have. The, the past adoption efforts may have been horrendous. And so people are actually pushed to more of this latent phase. They're like, yeah, I'm not only gonna work with it if I have to, um, versus more of that successful adoption and storytelling. Like, yeah, this did really work. People tried it out, they were test users, and it really transformed the way they work. And now our organization has adopted that way uh, as a de facto. You could think about, uh, you know, video chats and, and uh, Zoom meetings. Like none of us were really this far ingrained before, uh, b before all this isolation. And now we're working in a new way, adopting a new way. And even then we're still having some different um, upticks. But some of the people at the very end in this latent phase, they're not gonna update and, and change to a new way unless they're forced to, right? And so they adopt when forced. And a lot of us, probably this would have been the way, right? We, we kind of didn't have an option here. But it's important to know that you can find people in each and every group. And it's important to recognize what their drivers are, what their interests are. What do they need to really go to the next level? And of course, you want to get to this hump where you kind of start to roll downhill then. Um, and you get this late majority which is driven by this fear of missing out where they see there's a clear benefit and there's momentum there, like, oh, I better jump on this and get on this Teams thing. I don't know what this is, but you know, a lot of people are starting to use it. Or uh, how do I do a Zoom meeting again? You know, I, I need to figure this out. Um, and, and so technology adoption is a tricky thing because everyone's in a different place. You have to respect that and help meet people where they're at, open those communication channels and also integrate that into part of your platform development. Again, thinking about adoption. And finally, this latent group, understanding where criticism comes from and why. I think those are very important aspects. So once you get adoption of your MVP, your minimal viable product in terms of platform development, where do you go? This is where I think it's really important to have a solid development plan and something that has growth potential and, and is sustainable. And so I look at this long-term outlook where you start with your MVP and you expand out and you have these in mind kind of up front saying, well, we can't do everything right away, but if the MVP works and we get some good engagement, good adoption, then we can add on some features, MVP plus, get to kind of this phase two, phase three expansion where you're starting to unlock new growth potentials, unlock new capabilities out of the platform itself, new things are happening. And all of a sudden people start to ask for more. Once you have the right data architecture and design in place, and those foundations are set, then all of a sudden it's like, oh my gosh, oh, oh well now that that's there, we can do X, Y, and Z also. And 
So it's staging that out and helping to really set these things and ultimately working backwards towards that where you started, that blue sky achievement. It's like what's possible and going from there on out from the ground up approach uh, in terms of implementation. And so that's, that's what I have to share with you today. I hope uh, I can take some questions. I'm just going to kind of come back here. And it's a little bit different than just going to a singular use case. I wanted to be a bit more broad and make sure that I gave people a chance to really see where they might be struggling in some of these um, foundational concepts. Because I see a lot of work being done where it's just one or two key elements that are missing in the puzzle that keeps, keeps things from really churning.